Greetings adventures, this is Lore and your guild advisor back at it to do the informal review for Damachi Season 4 Episodes 3 through 5. Like the previous video, this is like my informal thoughts, non-scripted, outside of the cuts and changes videos as I can talk about uh, what happened in the anime adaption freely. Normally I'd be doing this episode and recording it like in front of my bookshelf because a lot of you guys like seeing like what's on my shelf with all the merchandise and stuff. Uh, but I'm going to be talking a lot about the visuals in this video. So I need like a visual aid on my computer so I can like look through clips of the episodes so I can talk about them. And that's really hard to do uh, without a computer. So we're just going to get started uh, starting with episode three. I did take notes uh, throughout the weeks on certain points I wanted to touch on. So it's not like I'm trying to like remember what the heck happened two weeks ago. I do have certain points I want to touch on, but of course the majority of the discussion will be on episode five as that's the episode that just came out most fresh in my mind and also where a lot of the awesome things happen because it's the climax of volume 12. Starting with episode three, uh, we have like this little recap of the Moss huge fight from the previous episode in episode two. It was a very well animated fight when we saw it in the second episode, but uh, I did see some people go, man, we could have had something else here because we just kind of had like a recap that took like a minute or so when we could have had something else. So I, I understand that viewpoint. Uh, also, the episode like leaves a lot of the Moss huge points of view out, which I explained in the cuts and changes video. And uh, I understand how that's difficult for the anime to do because we can't they can't really show the thoughts of the Moss Huge because it can't actually speak. So you can't just like go, well, we're going to give the Moss Huge a voice and it's going to sound like this because it can't speak. We we can see its thoughts clearly in the novel form, but the anime has its work cut out for him uh, in regards to that. Like the only thing that could really do is like try to show what the Moss Huge is doing through actions and through like facial gestures, uh, the creepy face that it has. And they do do that sometimes, uh, and I'll point that a lot in episode 5. But yeah, that's just what they have to deal with. If you want to see more into the Moss Huge point of view, I explain a bit of it in the Cuts and Changes video, or you could go ahead and read the novel. Like there, there needs to be a reason to read the novel, because after all, the anime, like as awesome as it is to like see the stuff from the books in action we're not going to get like a one for one page by page word for word adaption that's impossible no light novel to anime adaption does that like not even re-zero and they did a lot during season two they had like they cut the ops cut the eds had extended episodes that were like always 28 minutes long and even then they still had to like cut stuff out because it's just not realistic to like, there needs to be a reason to go out and read the book, basically. And in my Cuts and Changes videos, I talk a lot about how they actually, like, take the exposition from the narration in the light novel and actually use that to give lines to characters. Uh, I love how they have been continuing to do that. Just, like, the pacing of the season so far, it's like they're adapting less pages per episode as opposed to seasons two and three uh, because we have arguably double the episodes to work with now with this like like it was a leak that this season was going to be 22 episodes or at least two core and as of today i still don't think there's an official confirmation on that but they really can, they can't really do anything else than that a two core because we're using five episodes potentially six because next episode episode six should be the dentist uh, that they skipped in episode one and then they should be starting like into volume 13 content with episode seven and it is like literally impossible <laughs> to adapt 13 and volume 14 uh, within the remaining like six episodes <laughs> that we would have in a typical like 12 episode core so it looks like volume 14 is going to be a core by itself whether that's 11 or 12 episodes I don't want to get too into it right now as I should be talking about that stuff more towards the end of this video. Let's get back uh, into episode three stuff. Uh, one thing I mentioned that really like kind of bothered me, like it's not that big of a deal. So when it comes to the framing for when Bell uses his Argonaut to charge his foot 
to launch himself towards the Maz Huge, who's about to ambush the supporters. Uh, I think I talked a bit about that in Cousin Change's video, and also in some replies to some comments on the video. Uh, but as, as how I see it, I think they could have communicated uh, Bell's speed a bit better, because there's a like certain sequence, it doesn't last too long, maybe like two seconds uh, during that, where Bell, it doesn't look like Bell's going fast, uh, based like on the background. Like, it, it just kind of looks silly to me, because he's kind of just seemed like he was floating in the air awkwardly, when he's supposed to be going like super fast. So that, that's just like the, a small thing that bothered me, like maybe they could have just had him like, leaning forward a bit more, having draw like some speed lines behind him to, to uh, visualize like uh, how fast he's going, or just have the background uh, scroll by a bit faster, like something like that. But it's it's such a small thing, and that lasts like two seconds. But it stood out to me because I was because I'm taking notes on the episodes, trying to make these videos, so I'm I'm watching a bit closely, and that that's just what stood out to me. And then obviously, I mentioned that the fight that Bell has with the Moss Huge underwater was cut. I don't mind that too much because. Like, it is quite the struggle in the light novel. Like, Bell's basically getting... He's getting beat on because he's not familiar with fighting underwater. Even the Undyne gear can't really help him because the Moss Huge is more uh, familiar with the environment. And Bell's also tangled by the vines. And then he, then he gets uh, attacked by an Aqua Serpent that's, like, drilling into his arm like it, it's it's not fun for bell it's not a fun experience for him but i understand why that was cut this entire season like all these books 12 through 14 take place in the dungeon so there's a lot of action and that it's just unrealistic for like the animators to be animating like every single battle that takes place throughout these two cores because it's just like an insane amount of of frames that need to be drawn like with a like a slice of life series or like a more casual setting like a romantic comedy like in a school setting they don't have to animate as as many frames because most of that is just like characters talking to each other and then here in Don Machi a more action oriented series and even more so cuz we are constantly fighting monsters in the dungeon it's just not realistic for them to be animating every single fight and i I totally understand that. So if you want like the full version of the underwater fight, definitely check out the light novel uh, if you are not reading the light novels yet. And then the thing I think bothered most people in this episode is how they adapted the Iguasu encounter. And even I understand that because if you like watch the scene again and again, it, it's a tiny bit underwhelming. I think uh, part of the problem, at least to me, is maybe like they shouldn't have like cut away from when Bell was fighting them. Like we should have just had like one one continuous thing instead of like going back to the point of view of the expedition crew in between that. Because basically what happened with the Iguazu fight in the anime is that we got like the start of it and then we don't really see the part where everything clicks for Bell and then his body's in tune. We kind of just see like before his body's in tune and then after his body's in tune. We don't really see that that transition and then the the other thing uh, as far as the animation goes it kind of it kind of looks a bit silly if like maybe not at first glance but if you like look at the Iguasu animation like you have these like big uh big things like smearing through the screen and it kind of doesn't make sense if you think about it hard enough because uh, the way to animate it it just looks like the things are are going past Bell instead of Adam. Like there's some that are going at Bell, but the other Iguasu are just like going past him. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, that that kind of looks weird. Though uh, I I haven't actually like checked all the credits for every episode because I can't read Japanese. But but I assume that like a lot of episode three and episode four were like outsourced to outside studios, so not not a lot of the like animation cuts that were drawn for episode three and four were necessarily done in-house by JC staff. And I believe I talk about that a lot in the cuts and changes videos where I believe like some of the animations just kind of like being saved or held back because a lot 
of the focus is for the animation in episode five and uh you could tell it was with episode five you can definitely tell but yeah, that was episode three like it was a pretty good adaption of like the overall material it was just like uh things in terms of how stuff was framed or animation wise that might be uh, that have a few underwhelming things but overall good we go to episode four episode four was was very strange to me uh and i'll explain why i mean first we have the like before bell meets mari like she kind of hides after they first see each other because the sirens and harpies are making their way over and we skip that those fights uh in the anime and uh something interesting because i was replying to a comment to explain something they were wondering why bell was so uncomfortable seeing like a a bare-chested mari in the dungeon when mermaids are creatures that you expect to find in the dungeon uh but other, other than the fact that bell is a young innocent boy <laughs> other than that that got me thinking it's like yeah it, it might have helped uh at least showcasing the other mermaids in the episode because typical mermaids uh which you can't see in the anime obviously are are a lot more grotesque and more monstrous in appearance and Mari looks very different from the typical mermaid because she looks more human-like. And that's why Belle is, is a bit uncomfortable. So it would have helped if they showed at least the other mermaids in the anime to show the, how different Mari is from other mermaids. And it's also explained in the novel. Like, like Belle wonders like how other adventurers like aren't uh, like captivated by her beauty uh, because Mari is so different. And then Mari like kind of, kind of, sees what bell means and then she like starts covering her face with her hair and then like bell's like oh yeah okay i can see how you can get people to, to think you're a regular mermaid then uh yeah and the other thing the i mentioned this in the twitter post uh the name translations it, this is just like a a universal problem for don machi and it's very frustrating because it, it's just frustrating as a fan because people will be discussing like don machi and then everyone everyone uses different names for characters you have the the l spelling for ryu like liu in the light novel and then like the official organization and like all the merchandise for ryu in japan is is r r y u ryu it's even in the japanese uh version the japanese uh episode ryu light novel if you go to the back her name is written as Ryu R Y U. It's even that way in the in the mobile game, and the anime subtitles, and then in the light novel is L Y U. And then we have this whole stuff with uh, Lido Rido Gross Gross. I yeah. Uh, we come on, guys. Everyone that's in charge of translating Don Machi, like it's it's messed up because there's so many different companies involved. Like this company has the game, this company has the anime, this company has the light novel. I don't know why, why like people like insist on like this is this is our translation. We're not gonna follow anyone else's. It's just confusing for the fans. So uh, yeah, I wish it was consistent. It's just frustrating. Uh, anyway, and rant. Like other series don't have this problem. Or most other series don't have this problem, but Damachi does for whatever reason. And rant this time for real. Yeah. And then uh yeah, we skip some fights that happen as Belle is like running with Mari. That's not that big of a deal, because they weren't that detailed in the novel anyway, because it, they're like one sentence of like Belle encountered this and this and that. And that's what the that's what the fights were in the light novel. So I can see why the anime just kind of skipped that. Plus they're saving things for episode five. Uh, as far as Mikito's Zeka, her quick draw technique, like quick draw techniques, I think are really nice <laughs> for animators to do because they don't take too many frames uh, drawing wise because it's a quick draw, right? Like sheath, unsheath, resheath, like that's the quick draw. But uh, I like the animation. It's just that I I wish that we got like a, a more impressive like framing for it. It's like a like a side-by-side -side thing where like Mikito is on this side and then the monster is on this side and that's the angle we got instead of like a from behind like I guess the from behind uh Mikito frame works if you're like thinking you're in the point of view of the party but I think it would have been like more cinematic if it was like a side-to-side -side thing and you see Mikito quick draw as the monster like tries to go past her and then just explodes like that 
but it, that's a, a small thing. That's a more of a, a personal preference on my part. He also cuts on showing the boss huge, like actually eating the adventure corpses and its little hideaways. Uh, it's not that big of a deal if that was cut. Uh, I, but I want to see some monsters eat some humans. <laughs> and then the other thing that like really stood out to me, because again, I'm watching the episodes really closely, is that I felt like a lot of the faces in episode four uh, kind of looked a bit derpy or, or off model, especially wealth. Like I could, I can't really explain like that well, cause I'm I'm not an animator. I don't I don't draw things, but a lot of times it feels like Welf's face is off. Like maybe it's the face shape or or how thick his eyebrows are. But I'll I'll put like pictures up in the video. It's not even just his face either. I think Aisha has like a a dirt face, and it it's not like episode five didn't have like some weird faces, but. They were like a lot smaller. The character like wasn't the focus, so you didn't notice it as much, but not that big of a deal uh, to be honest, because again, you probably have to be watching really closely to even notice that. Uh, but overall episode four, like I was surprised by how much uh, content episode four was because it actually wasn't that much uh, page count wise. And I, I think some comments, or at least one of them pointed that out, that like the pacing episode felt slow and i think a big reason for that is just because like they stopped right before tokonoe haruhime's thing they stopped right before that because i think they wanted to do like most of episode five in-house so uh have like the a team work on kokonoe and then of course the mass huge fight all in one episode i think that's uh partly why it happened that way as well but i'd prefer a slower pacing for uh, season four as opposed to the super fast pacing we got during seasons two and three very seldom would i like wish an ad adaption's pace would be going faster because typically uh, adaptions skip content so i'd appreciate a slower pace like we're getting here episode four overall like the content they adapted was done well just uh, a few minor things that bother me in terms of like animation not that big of a deal because uh Episode 5, the big one, where I'm going to be talking a lot, because that's the one fresh in my mind. So the episode begins with the flashback between Haruhime and Aisha, and they're basically uh, like adapting a lot of the conversation that they kind of cut in episode 1. So I appreciate uh, seeing the rest of it here. There's still a mention about Aisha taking the Grimoire from Hermes Familia, but as I noted in the Cuts and Changes video, it makes sense why they would not include it here. Uh, because this is like a, a serious moment in the middle of a battle, so it doesn't like make sense to uh, insert something like humorous in the middle of that. So I get that. And uh, as far as the presentation for Kokonoe, I think it was it was done very well. I, I was very very happy with what we got here, especially uh, the shot where the tails are growing and then like the camera's kind of spinning around Haruhime. I love that, and also. Uh, the framing we got so you have like a frame of of like you see like a, fr a from behind a uh, haruhime view and then you see mikito and oka like in front of her uh defending her from the monsters and then you also have like a view uh from the front of oka and mikito defeating monsters uh defending haruhime i love those two frames like it's just like a little extra thing a little, little subtle thing that i thought looked nice the showcase always going on in terms of like Haruhime's point of view and I I really did like how the flashbacks were incorporated and uh they also uh tied in some more Hestia like again Hestia does not bother me as a character it just bothers me when they try to like over include her or kind of just make her a joke because there are a lot of times where Hestia has serious moments in the light novels but they don't touch on them too much in the anime so I appreciate how they use Hestia here. Like it's one way to get more Hestia screen time because we don't see too much of her uh, in these arcs because it takes place in the dungeon and we get to see a more serious side to Hestia here, which I appreciate. I appreciate it a lot, uh, much more than the uh, the weird ED. <laughs> Another thing I think some people might point out is uh, at some point when they're fighting against the monster party, uh, after Dormal and Lubis and the crew are like trying to help, like I saw some criticism for like the still images used there. Like you see like a still image and it's panning and the camera's kind of shaking. 
there's no animation there i didn't mind that much because again we we got what we wanted uh, like the moments that needed to be animated well were done well like kokonoe and then the moss huge fight with bell so here i don't mind it too much because like how many times do we need to see uh uh the party like kill blue kill blue crabs <laughs> I think at some point the animators also might get uh, tired up and like, okay, how many times, how many different ways do we need to showcase the party killing blue crabs? So it it really did not uh, bother me that much at all. It's like, do we really need that many well animated sequences of us just killing fodder? So yeah, there's that. Uh, I love the way uh, the Moss Huge evolved and what it looked like because. I don't believe we really see like a full illustration of the Moss Huge uh, in the light novel. So it's really cool to see the uh, anime's interpretation of what the Moss Huge would look like, especially its evolved design. I really like that. The uh, the extendable mouth. I was not expecting that, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I know I remember the his mouth extending in the light novel, but I didn't think it would be to that degree. And I, I really liked how how off-putting and grotesque that was when we saw it. So yeah, and I also liked uh, how Aisha uh, got surprised here because uh, in the light novel, uh, I think she was like mainly just on on the ground defending and then at some point the Mas Huge got her. Uh, but here in the anime, she's like in the air where she can't really move as well. And then that's when uh, the Mas Huge like does a little surprise attack and catches Aisha off guard. Uh, I know some people were like, well, Aisha's level boosted to five. Shouldn't she have been able to put up more of a fight uh, when uh, when you see Bell over here, like absolutely <laughs> destroying the Moss Huge to the end of the episode? Uh, one thing to, to point out is that Aisha, she is level four and being boosted to five. But earlier in, in the show, she, she does mention that she thinks Bell is already like past her in terms of stats, and he is. And... The other thing is that as Bell has leveled up over the course of the series, his speed is always the highest stat. So a level four Bell's speed is pretty much already like at level five status as far as just his speed stat. Aisha just kind of has like a bad matchup against the Moss Huge because she, her main weapon of choice is this huge gigantic sword and she can't move that around like Bell can move with his dagger. So combine bell's speed with his weapon of choice like that's how you overwhelm the moss huge it was by speed and then uh, aisha doesn't really have that in her repertoire especially with her weapon of choice but i just still got a really she did a really good job defending against the moss huge especially considering after she got her shoulder bitten like several bones breaking inside chunk of flesh being bitten off she did an incredibly good job holding it off and the rest of the party even after that happened to her. So uh, give Aisha some credit. It's not like she just completely fell apart after that. Like she was still given the Moss Huge uh, at least something to work with. So it couldn't reach the rest of the party. And I did like the little tweak the anime made in terms of like Lily talking about what's happening with Haruhime and the party. When uh, Dormal and Lubis' groups are wondering what the heck's going on in the light novel. She's like, uh, simply put, they uh, got a level boost. And then in the anime, she's just like, none of, none of you speak of this. Like, that, that's probably a better thing. Like, they did promise not to talk about what happened, but Lily has no reason to just, like, outright say what is happening. So I think that's a good move by the anime. A lot of the times uh, in the light novel, when Lily's being, like, referred to as a strategist, there's, like, a, a lot of comparisons to Braver, Finn. I can understand why the anime didn't, Put as much emphasis on that because a lot of that connection has to do with the side story in volume 8 that was not uh, animated for the anime where uh, Finn actually proposes to Lily so Finn and Lily have this connection they know each other like Lily like knows a lot about Finn's mindset so I get why they don't try to draw uh, the connection between those two in the anime because of what they did not animate before so that makes sense to me and the other thing is, like, uh, I think the anime maybe like Dormal and Lubis a bit more. They seem more, at least, like, it's been a long time <laughs> since, like, I didn't reread Volume 12 in, until 
like covering this season. From what I remember, like back when I read Lion 12 the first time, I, I still kind of thought of Dormal and Lubis as like kind of jokey characters because uh, they come off as jokey characters in volume eight, which was, uh, and that side story was skipped for the anime. But uh, they seem a lot more confident here, and uh, that makes me happy because they are level three adventurers, so they, they should have some degree of confidence to them. So I, I like how the anime characterizes them. And this is kind of a detail that's just understood in the light novel, but I like how they included like a little tiny animation of like after all the party uh, gets into the hole that Lily makes when Bell's about to use his Argonaut Firebolt. I love like as Lily is jumping down, she like takes off her Goliath robe and then like covers them as uh, Bell's about to use a Firebolt because uh, that the heat would not be fun to feel <laughs> if she did not do that. So I, I like how the anime includes it like a little small detail there. And uh, <laughs> another funny note I made is that uh, they, they skipped Bell doing his little arm raise because like in the anime, you see like Bell like doing the, the cool slow walk. He's not really talking that much. He just says thank you to Lily as he drinks the, the potion. And then uh, after his dialogue with Aisha, where Aisha's like, I'll leave it to you. Uh, Light Novel also has a wealth say like, go get him. And then Bell doesn't say anything, but he simply like raises his arm raise as an acknowledgement as he continues like doing his slow walk. And I made the note that uh, the anime just had to nerf uh, Bell's cool factor a tiny bit. We gotta remove that arm raise, Bell. You can't be that cool. And then, uh, yes, the the beginning of the Moss Huge fight. I love that frame of them, like side by side in, in the arena. I love that. And then the little anime edition of like the the fight starting when the drop of water falls down. I love that. Like it's such a small thing, but I, I love it. And then for the actual fight itself, I mentioned in the cuts and changes video that uh, thank God Omori Sensei uh, made the Twitter post before I like started recording the voiceover because <laughs> I would have been like, man, why'd you why'd you wait this long? But yeah, I was still uh, reviewing uh, the script that I made when he made that Twitter post. Like, oh, thank God I can revise this. But yeah, basically uh, in the light novel, Bell is dual wielding with both the Hestia knife and Hakugen during this fight. Uh, but Omori Sensei said that he suggested that Bell only use Haku again for this fight, so I guess so Argo Vesta would stand out more. I, I had the thought, like maybe maybe Bell is just flexing on the Moss here. Like I don't even need the Hestia knife to beat you. In fact, I'm only gonna use my left hand, my non-dominant hand. That's all I need to fight you, Mr. Moss Huge person. All I need. Kind of like he's doing his uh, Princess Bride impression. Because I know something you don't know. And what is that? I am not left-handed. I'm not even left-handed. So I'm happy that got cleared up, and I think they made up for not uh, having the dual wield fight here. Uh, Amora Sensei said, like, from now on, we should be seeing more dual wielding. Uh, but in terms of the animation, they made up for it, definitely. Like I said in the video that there's not, it's not like too descriptive about what happens like move by move in the light novels so the animators like have a lot of creative freedom to do what they want and i love the the original segments they made for this fight like they, they got the deflecting the bullet seeds that's from the light novel i love how they animated it that like that one slow motion one into bell like getting all of them i love how that was done and then of course that long sequence of when Bell just rips up the mouth when he's midair, is dodging all the vines for running across the walls, and then slices off the arms of the Moss Huge at the end of the sequence. That I I love that. Like that that got me I wanna say that got me clapping, but I was watching that during my lunch break at work, so I can't just stand up and clap. And then we have Argo Vesta, which I think is the main talking point for a lot of people about the episode. Yeah, with Argo Vesta, I love the way, uh, like, the buildup is with Argo Vesta. Like, Bell pulling out his knife, charging the the blade with Firebolt, and then using Argonaut to charge both the knife and the blade at the same time. Like, I love how it looked when you saw the, the flame go on and then the blade extend. I love how that looked. I love how you see the Moss Huge, like, kind of shield himself with his arm as the flare from uh, the initial Firebolt is like flaring up and then focusing on to the knife. So again, they're doing what they can to showcase what the Masuge is feeling. Like 
Uh, also, earlier in the episode, you, you see some funny things like uh, the moss huge like kind of smirking mockingly at Aisha right before it starts hitting the stones. I love that. Also, when uh, Welf uses his ice magic sword to like freeze the water so the moss huge can't retreat. Uh, you can kind of see the Mas Huge get angry, like ye like kind of yell at Wealth, like, hey, what the heck? So I love that they tried to communicate some of the emotions the Mas Huge was feeling that way. And like, yeah, everything with the, like, the buildup to Argo Vesta was done very well. Like, I love like how, like right before Bell is like going in to do the killing blow, uh, he like brings the blade backwards and you see like all the flames around them. I love how that was framed. That was awesome. Most of the problem that people have well, with the Argo Vesta thing is like at the very end, like the finishing blow. In the in the anime, you kind of just see like uh, the flames inside of the Moss Huge and then it just kind of uh, gets destroyed. Like and in the light novel, it's more like a like a white flash that that's enveloping the entire room and then followed by a red one and this big flare. And then uh, and then the Moss Huge is just incinerated. That's how it is in the light novel. So I can understand why people like wanted like a more one for one adaption there. Like I wasn't thinking too much about that uh, on the first watch because I was like really hyped by the like the original segments. I was not expecting to see like Bell running like in the air, taking out, uh, slicing up the mouth, running on the walls. I was not expecting to see that. So I was super hyped. And also the, everything with the build up to Argo Vesta was done really well. Like if you're an anime only, that the Argo Vesta finishing blow still probably look cool. Uh, the other thing is that, again, uh, this didn't bother me until it was like uh, pointed out and I like kept rewatching it. But you see Bell like kind of spin around like three times before uh, doing the, the blow. Uh, I think what they were trying to do, I don't think it's supposed to be like Bell spinning, but it's actually the camera that's spinning around them. Except I don't think that worked too well because the Moss Huge is still in the frame and so and the Moss Huge isn't spinning so the camera can't really be spinning around Bell so Bell has to be the one spinning so I think like maybe there is just a, an oversight there because I really don't think it it doesn't make sense for Bell to be spinning like that I, I feel like it would have been a bit better if they kind of just had the Moss Huge out of the frame while the well, I think the intention was to have the camera spinning, like have them out of the frame as the camera is spinning and then put them into the frame uh, right after the spins are done into the killing blow. Or if their intention was to have Bell spin, just do one spin because that, that would make the most sense. Like do the one spin for momentum. It doesn't make sense for Bell to be doing three. So I get that. Like that, I, that could have been done a bit better. But overall, the fight was really, really well done. And it makes me... It gives me faith, basically. It, it gives me a lot of faith on what uh, the next fights are going to be like. Because if you if you're anime only and you thought the Moss Huge fight was done really well and enjoyed it, the next two big climactic fights, the the climax of thirteen and the climax of volume fourteen, they are so much more grander in scale. It, it's going to be crazy, incredible if the uh, if the projection schedule uh, doesn't fall apart. And they know what scenes to focus on and we see that they clearly know what scenes to focus on here with how they adapted volume 12. like i am very happy like i some point this out as well like my my attitude with season four is like completely different from when i was covering seasons two and three and a big part of that like my my big attitude turnaround was with episode two and I mentioned that in the in the cuts and changes video, I think that's when I started to like really have faith because it wasn't like the action. It was more of like a lot of the dialogue what was kept intact. They kept a lot of the dungeon mechanic explanations in the anime where they didn't really have the time to do that with seasons two or three because they were going to the material at a really fast pace. But now with with two cores, it looks like like it's not official yet, but it's it's hard to imagine it being anything but that because volume 14 is is as long as volumes 13 and 12 combined it's impossible to cover all of volume uh, uh, 13 and 14 with the remaining episode time we have left 
So yeah, two core, definitely. Whether it's gonna be split or continuous, we don't know. I think it's intended to be continuous because I've said this before, but the uh, Estrella Record light novels are releasing in three simultaneous months. So three volumes in three months. It doesn't make sense to release them that fast in the fall if they're going to be doing a split core where the next core would happen like the later half of the episodes would happen in winter it doesn't make sense to release those three novels all at once like that at least in my mind unless like they feel like they need the extra time i think the intention is to have uh this be a continuous two core thing so we're gonna see like more episodes in the fall as opposed to just uh, like this ending at episode 11 or 12 at the end of this summer season for anime. If by the end of where we get to uh, animating volume 14 at, like, at, at that final fight, at the climax of 14, if I'm like not on the ground in tears from the epicness, something something wrong happened. <laughs> something wrong happened because that's if this level of effort is made for that, I, I will be in tears on the ground in joy, and I I could not, like, when season three ended, I could not imagine myself being this excited for this show <laughs> today, because I was just kind of let down by seasons two and three a lot in terms of the anime adaption. Like, there, there was a point where, like, I, I think I said this, or at least thought this, where... I did not want them animating season four period if the level of adaption that we would get was just like season two or three level like I, I didn't want it I did not want it if that's if that's what we were going to get and thankfully we're getting like the proper amount of episodes it seems like I'm I'm so so happy about that plus we have a more sensei like more involved with the writing staff so I think uh I think he's trying to st <laughs> steer the ship a little. But again, the episode count really helps. And uh, oh yeah, another note I wanted to, to point out here. Because the translations between the light novel and the anime are different for this specific line. But right before Bell uses Argo Vesta, he says uh, in Japanese, Shobuda. And in the in the light novel, it's translated as Game On, which I, I get that's a... That's a weird thing for Bell to say, game on. And then the anime translation is, let's end this. So like, because those lines were like so different, I wanted to look up what Shobuda meant in uh, in Japanese. So, and then it seems like there's not like a good way to like literally translate it into English, but the uh, Japanese intention of Shobuda is it's like something you say when the winner of a match has been decided. So basically, basically Bell called game <laughs> in front of the boss huge. He's like, you're done. How I would translate that knowing that's the intention, I would either have like said like, it's over or like, you're done. <laughs> I, I think it, it's over would have been, uh, would probably be a cooler translation to say. And also a, a little cool anime touch is uh, Mari, uh, peeking out under the ice that was so i love that it was cute and i think uh pretty smart of them to do because in the light novel like it was kind of hard to visualize because it said she was like on the other side of the frozen stream so i guess like part of the stream that wealth did not freeze like she's kind of like back there and i think it's probably it'd be easier for the party to see mari if she was just like in the water so I like how the anime does it, where she's peeking out like under the ice. I love that. It's so funny. And then uh, next episode, next episode, it's leaked online. I had not seen a single frame of it. I don't want to see it until it's officially out. So maybe like what I'm going to say here is is outdated as soon as I say it. Uh, but I'm going with this discussion uh, not having any knowledge of that because I think a lot of you don't want to be watching it until it's officially out. I'm, I don't even know if there's like a fan sub for it. I don't know if it's just like the Japanese raw. I have no idea. But yeah, next episode, it's called Rabbit's Foot. Or oh God, dang you, hide that. Rabbit Foot? Rabbit Foot? Uh, it should cover, uh, based on that, it should be covering the Denitus, uh The meeting that was skipped in the first episode between the gods where they pick names. Wealth should also get his name. Uh, Shigisa should also get her name as well. And 
I, I don't think they're going to actually start volume 13 stuff because they actually ended this episode five, like right before the epilogue of volume 12, which is like three pages or something like that. It's not that long. So I'm wondering what they're going to do to stretch it out to the length of an entire episode. Because I'm assuming they still want to utilize uh, the ending of Volume 12 because, like, the very last page is a cliffhanger. And it, it's a perfect cliffhanger for the end of an episode. So I don't see them, like, using that, uh, like, in the middle of an episode. That doesn't make any sense. So one thing they could do is uh, introduce, like, some flashbacks for stuff that happens between the Feistus and Wealth. And it, would, it wouldn't be out of place because Hephaestus is, is involved in this dentist meeting and they kind of teaser uh, about wealth. So that's a perfect part to do a flashback to some scenes of Hephaestus and wealth together uh, because they were skipped in season two when they kind of just adapted volume eight into two episodes. So that would be the perfect opportunity for it. And I also pointed out, I think it was episode two, uh, where wealth... They, they kind of changed some context for when Welf uh, saw the Underpearl stuff. Because he said he saw it uh, when he visited Hephaestus in the anime. But the actual line of the light novel is that he saw it back when he was in uh, Hephaestus Familia. So I think they're like trying to allude to the fact that we are going to see some Welf and Hephaestus content. Because uh, it's kind of necessary for us to get some of that content because it's kind of used as motivation for, for things later on uh, in the next arc. So I think that's what they're going to put into next episode of Denitus and having some extended scenes or flashbacks uh, to call back for some stuff that was skipped between Hephaestus and Wealth in previous seasons. So I'm hoping that's what happens. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I look like an absolute fool right now for people that actually like looked at the leaked episode. But again... I'm seeing all this not knowing what's in the leaked episode, and I'll be watching it next week. I also have no idea what I should read for next week, because the assumption is that we're not starting Volume 13 until Episode 7. But uh, I'm not opposed to reading a bit of <laughs> Volume 13. It's one of my favorite volumes. Like, oh no, I have to read one of my favorite volumes. Oh, oh no. But yeah, I think that's going to do it uh, for this discussion very long it's gonna be edited down where i'm being stupid and it's gonna be a lot of editing work to insert the video clips <laughs> which is funny because this is supposed to be like an informal kind of thing where i just talk about the episode uh but yeah i'm curious on what your thoughts were on the episodes especially episode five especially if you're a, a light novel reader how did you feel about their interpretation of some things are you okay with like some of the animation in previous episodes being held back for the more climactic moments. Uh, it would be weird if you weren't okay with that because <laughs> it's just unrealistic for everything to be animated uh, crazy well. It, like, you're not going to see that with like almost any show unless it's by like uh, Kyo Annie. <laughs> Interested in seeing what your opinions are. I love it. I I'm so much looking forward to the rest of the adaption. I, I could not imagine myself being in the in the mind space i am today i could not imagine myself being in that mind space like a year and a half ago but i was so distraught by how seasons two and three were treated in terms of uh, how they adapted the material i can't believe i'm i am as happy as i am right now so yeah that's gonna do it for this informal review thing but yeah guys video long but th this is what you guys wanted you guys wanted these longer informal episodes uh, in addition to the cuts and changes ones, because you, you like uh, the passion I have for the series and you want to see it unfiltered. So here you go. But yeah, if you want to see more Tanmachi content, go ahead and like the video, sub to the channel. Remember to follow me on my socials. And as always, this is Lauren, your Guild Advisor, signing out.